What I want to talk about today is our efforts in preparing our user community for um, our next system, which is Cori. So, it, it, and it's kind of the broader question. And I think a lot of the theme of this week is is how do you get ready for the next big thing? So, before we get started, I guess I'm supposed to look over here. Um, I want to give you a little background on NERSC for maybe those of you who don't know. So NERSC is a, is, a, is a supercomputing center, and in many ways it's a lot like, like Blue Waters. So we're a DOE center, we're funded by the Office of Science, and within the Office of Science we have the unique mission, there's no other supercomputer center that has the mission of supporting the science that is done by the Office of Science. So the Office of Science gives out a lot of money to do research in basically the physical sciences, and a lot of people probably don't know that it's the largest funder of research, of basic science research in the physical sciences in the US. And so if you get a grant from DOE and you need computers or supercomputers or the kind of computers and services that we provide, you can apply to get time at NERSC and you will almost certainly get some amount of time. So what this means is that we have a very broad community of um, users, we have about 7,000. We have lots of codes. We ask people for their names, codes, and we get about 700, but there's lots of other ones that people are working on all the time. And we have to support all of these guys. So we have a huge um, array of different kinds of algorithms, of different kinds of users, different kinds of experience with the users, and um, it's a very broad community. So this is something I will come back to over and over, is that, that we don't um, pick our users, so DOE, gives out most of the time. So 80% of the time that's used in our um, computers are given out by DOE program managers in support of their program mission or their objectives and that sort of thing. So those can be anybody. We don't get to, we don't get to go and pick um, codes that run well on our machines. We have to take all the codes that are coming and try to provide resources, machines, services, and things like that to support um, all of these guys. About another 10% are from this, um, this competitive program run by um, DOE called ALCC, and you just need to know this is a, a competition that's open to promote innovative or maybe um, untried um, computational and, and data uh, tasks. And then we have about 10% of our time that we can give out um, what we call the dir director's discretionary reserve, and this time goes to maybe industrial partners, maybe to, to uh, people who are trying out um, HPC, uh, beyond just what we call our startups. So somebody that might be new to HPC, but they have a bigger problem that they want to try. So with, after that introduction, I want to, to start with this quote from Heraclitus, which is, it was a great a Greek um, philosopher who was known for his doctrine that, that, the uni that change is fundamental to the universe. So we in this community know all about change. Right? Every year, this is a plot of the single threaded floating port performance over the years, every year there's some new technology or some new, some new hardware that's coming out that's faster than it was the year before. So every year we've just been able to ride, to ride this impro improvement in, in, in hardware and architecture performance to get better and better at performance. And this was um, great for us because what it meant is that you could, and people largely did, take their MPI program that they wrote back in the 2000s-ish, or whenever the community went from the, the vector processors, shared memory processors, to kind of an MPI, uh, distributed memory processing computing paradigm, and you could pretty much take that same code, recompile it on the next thing that you got, and get better performance. So you, we were able to get better and better performance just by recompiling and uh, running on the next system. So performance, so you didn't have to change your code basically and you got better performance. But we knew, th we knew this wasn't going to go on forever. If nothing else, we could say I like this plot here, if, if nothing else we knew that if, if the trend continued um, along this lines up past kind of the mid 2000s that we would soon be up here at a power density on the chips that would, would essentially melt the chips. So even if we could afford to power them, these things, we wouldn't be able to actually build them and sustain them. So what has happened? What has happened is that the frequency didn't go up because the power consumption and goes up with the frequency. And the frequency um, stopped going up at about the mid 2000s and it's flattened off. And that got the power to flatten off as well 
but the single thread performance has either stayed or gone down or, or Im improved at a much, much slower rate. And so what has driven this ability to keep performance on a single socket, on a single node um, of processors is we're putting more and more cores onto the processor. So, th so this is the trend, right? That, so that the, the processor speed is not, frequency is not going up, but we're getting more and more codes, um, more and more cores onto the, to the processors. So we knew this was coming about this time. And our community, we have a user survey that goes out every year. So in preparation for our next uh, procurement, which would be coming somewhere in, in the 2014 um, timeframe, we added a question to our user survey. And we said, are, you, are your codes ready for these many core processors? And as you can see, the biggest answer was overall, which is in the blue, was, I don't know what you're talking about, right? So this was a problem for us. And then we asked them various things about other things. And, and in, in general, it, the answer was, I, I don't know. I, the, people had been doing a little bit with threading, you know, as, as these um, previous processors had, had gotten more and more cores on, on, the, on the chip, but really um, people didn't know. At the, at the same time, we've been undertaking these series of what we call re requirements reviews. So what these are are workshops that we've been holding with each of the, the program areas within the Office of Science, and so there are six. So we had a series of six um, requirements reviews, and we'd go to DC, and we'd invite the, the leading application scientists in that area, the program managers, and some people from, from applied math and computer science, and say, what do you need for a system in the whatever time frame? In this case, we were asking for a 2017 time frame. And overall, there were a lot of different things, but, but there were some trends and some commonalities that emerged. And of course, the first one was that they needed more hours, and they needed more data, and they needed more storage, um, and that sort of thing. But then number two was they recognized, I guess we've been scaring them for a long time, but they recognized that they needed help moving their codes to many core because they didn't have codes that were ready, they didn't have the resources that were ready, and they, they knew they weren't ready. So this fed into our decision of our next procurement. So we, we do competitive procurements, um, and we could consider a lot of things. Uh, price performance is, of course, one of the main things. But then we also consider usability and, and, and is our community, our big community, ready for, for whatever is being proposed. And so uh, based on all that, uh, uh, the winner of our next procurement was this system we call Edison. So Edison was a, <coughs> a Cray um, XC30. Um, but the key thing about Edison, it was it had the next generation of Intel, um, essentially x86, um, <coughs> excuse me, what we might call heavyweight core processors. And um, people, our, our users loved Edison. Edison they, was fantastic for them. They got to continue to ride this. I have the same code I recompile on the next system, and it runs much faster. One of the key thing to notice about Edison is the clock speed was um, about the same. It might have even been a little bit slower, but approximately the same as the processors on our previous system, which was a Cray XE6 with a AMD MagniCores processor on it. But what was different, the, the interconnect was different, but what was really different, um, we think, is as we, anal as we looked at some of the codes and why they ran better, and, and they did run just essentially taking your code, recompiling it, and running on Edison, they did run on average two to three times faster than they did on the, our hopper system, which was our, our AMD XT6 system. And what we think was really key was the, the 100 gigabyte a second uh, of memory bandwidth that we got on Edison. And this compared to about, I think it was about 35 gigabytes a second on Hopper. So there was about three times um, increase in memory bandwidth, and, and a lot of the codes really are memory bandwidth bound. And so they love this. And so this was, this was a great system for them that they loved. But about the same time, in 2014, if you looked at the list of the top 500, the top 10 computers on the top, on the five, top 500 list, and um, you looked a little bit harder, you might see a trend. So tell me if you see anything that might be common um, among, these pro the, among these systems. And just looking at this, you could tell the writing was on the wall. So come time for our next procurement, we went through the whole RFP process again, put out a proposal, people came, uh, the vendors came back, with, um, with proposed systems. And the winner in this case from 
um, considering usability, price performance, capability, and everything else, was a, um, our next system, Cori, which will go into production actually in, in July of this year. It's another Cray system, it's an XC, XC40. Um, but what it is, is a system made up of the Intel Xeon Phi Knight's Landing many core processors. So with these processors, um, it's great for our users because we get a, a 30 petaflop peak system. But what's not so great for our system is for the first time in nurse 40 years of existence, the next system our users will, have, will want to run on has lower single thread performance than a previous system. So this is something that's, that's very much different. And um, in fact, when a lot, for a lot of our users, uh, they found out about this, one of their responses was, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> right. So they knew they weren't prepared in general, and they knew they didn't want to change their codes. But we think we had a lot of good reasons. Um, and some of them are listed here. Uh, and, and clearly, many core is the future um, of, uh, uh, of HPC. And we just thought this was the time to do it. This was the time to start transitioning the community and their codes on path to something that will be sustainable into, exos into the exascale era and, and, and beyond. So it is on the path to exascale, we believe. But the fact that this processor is, is not an accelerator. So it's, uh, the nodes are, are, are self-hosted. The operating system runs on the, the, on the Xeon Phi. Uh, there's, and, and so that's a good first step. It's homogenous. It's not a heterogeneous system. So if you're going to start making the transition, we thought this was a, 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 good, first, a, a good first way to do it. And in addition, the one characteristic of, of this chip is that there is now on-chip memory. So it's called MCD RAM, uh, generically high bandwidth memory. And the memory bandwidth, as I think I'll show it in a little bit, is about 450 to 500 gigabytes a second. So you, the fact that our code, so many of our codes are memory bandwidth bound, and they will be able to take advantage of this, this, high band, this high bandwidth memory, we thought was a definite plus. But that did present a challenge to us. So how are we going to get our very diverse, broad community of 7,000 users and 700 codes or her, um, onto this running well on this um, processor. And it was clear that, that business as usual was over. So people were not going to be able to just recompile their code and run it on this next system and get the kind of performance increase that they'd gotten um, over the years. So what we decided was this time to not look back, but move forward and put all our energy into getting the community there and making this system a success. So our, an our answer to this was to create this new program that we call the NERSC Exascale Scientific Application Program, or NESAP. I mean, DOE loves acronyms, so here's another acronym for us. But the goal was to prepare users for this next system. So what we were going to do was uh, partner with about 20 application teams and get their c codes to run really well with the community. But so one thing I should point out is that we had this vision of doing this, and so these are some of the, uh, in the little bubbles are some of the, the kind of strategies and, and things we wanted to do. But we started from essentially zero. We had almost no expertise in-house, um, certainly for optimizing for many core or for um, uh, this kind of system. And we really had very little expertise using a wide array of tools and techniques for optimization for this sort of thing. So we'd always had services that helped users debug code, um, optimized code, which usually, you know, kind of meant around the edges, but we had, we had no, um, as I said, knowledge about how to do this. So we were really starting from scratch. But one reason we thought we could be successful in our community is we looked at our workload, and it's true that we have 700 codes and, and, uh, and all these users, but if you look at this pie chart of hours used by different codes at, at NERSC, you see that if you look at the top 10 codes or so here, um, get down to Berkeley GW, it, it makes up about 50% of the hours used um, on our systems. So if we, could, if we could attack these codes and maybe a few others and actually work with them and actually get their codes ready for Cori, we actually could get a, 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 a decent percentage of, of the workload um, 
working. So what we did was we made a call for proposals in early 2014. And um, our evaluation criteria were, among other things, that was important to the Office of Science. We wanted to represent all the program areas. And then we also looked at the, the potential to produce um, interesting and significant science. We also wanted that, that whatever code development we did to be applicable not just to that single code, but to other codes that had similar problems or simil worked in, in similar ways. And then we also needed to match um, what resources we had or what we were accumulating with the vendor resources and some of the expertise. So we got, a lot, we got quite a few um, uh, responses. Um, but one thing that we told the, these, these groups they, they had to do, which I think is very important, was they had to work with us themselves, so we weren't going to do it for them. We had to work with us to really understand their code, to characterize their code, and, and understand how it was worked, and, you know, the, memory band, the memory bandwidth characteristics, the, the cache reuse characteristics, all these kind of details. Um, and then bullet two was they had to, we were not giving them any money to do this, right? But they, we were asking them to commit up to half a person up to an FTE of people that would be dedicated to working on this problem. So what this did was this made them you know, partners in this, and it made them buy in. So they had, to, they had a stake in the game. We weren't just going to take their codes and do it for them, right? And then they had to write reports um, about some of the progress. So we, we selected the, the codes. I'll flash them up here quickly. So you, some of you might, I won't go through them all, but some of you might recognize some of these codes, and maybe there's some of them that are common um, to Blue Waters. Um, but they were, again, they were in all the different areas, um, the program areas uh, of interest to DOE. And if you look then at the, 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 code, the code plot again, the, the things in, in, in dark green were actually um, codes that were selected to work with us with this program. The ones in lighter green are ones that had uh, similar techniques to some of the codes that we had selected. So for instance, um, molecular dynamics, um, here, NAMD and LAMPS were not, were not chosen as NESAP codes, but there were um, codes over here, I think mean, GROMAX, for instance, that d did molecular dynamics too. So the hope was that, that could, we could transfer some of the, the, the knowledge and lessons learned there. Uh, BAST, we noticed, was not, our top code was, was not initially um, a NESAP code, but really that we kind of grandfathered them in and we had a huge amount of, thank you, Bill, a huge amount of success. Um, actually partnering with, with the VASP developers. And actually VASP is now running, running very well on, on Night Sandy. So what did the code teams get? Again, they, they weren't getting money, but they were getting things like early access to hardware. So we got white boxes, um, which is the term for kind of early, early production hardware, um, early rev of the hardware, and they got to get onto those systems. When the core system did come in, in, in kind of the time that we were um, getting it ready for production, they got early access and exclusive access for a while. Um, but really what was key were these technical deep dives. So they got access to Cray and Intel staff, which was crucial for us, because as I said, we didn't have any real in-house expertise in the beginning. So we really needed to leverage the expertise that was in the, in the vendor communities, and, and that was very, very successful. And then these, the other thing that's worked extremely well are these multi-day multi deep dive, what we call dungeon sessions. Um, so the process here is that we <clears throat> identify, identify some of the NESAP codes. We ask them to extract some kernels or some smallish part of their code that is, is representative of, of their algorithm or takes a, a large part of their code time. And we bundle these up and we send them to Intel and Cray. First Cray gets them, then Intel gets them about a month ahead of these dungeon sessions. They look at them, they try to characterize their, their performance characteristics, and then in about a month, we actually take um, a group of people that are nurse staff, um, some people from the application performance teams, and we go up to Hillsborough in Oregon, where Intel is, and we go, in, uh, go all together in a room, which we call a dungeon because there's no windows, and we essentially lock people in there for three days, and they just work to optimize the heck out of these codes. And Intel has thrown a huge amount of, of, of resources at it. So um, the reason it's in Hills, Hillsborough is we, they can go, they have a core team of Intel, but they can go bring in experts in, in, various, in tools or in various techniques to come in and help during these, these sessions. And but the key thing about these is, what, why is Intel doing this? 
um, well, I think it's Intel's interest to get codes running well in this system also, but what we did was we wrote these dungeon sessions into the um, procurement. So this was part of the procurement of the system, included these 16 dungeon sessions with Intel. And so this was, this was, a, was, a, key, it was a key, I think, a key thing that really helped us get ready. So we'd also have done lots of user training. That was another of our strategies. Um, so we're not only teaching, the, we're not only working closely with these NESAP teams, but we're trying to, to as we learn and as we, as we go forward, um, it, transfer that knowledge to our, our user community in general. Um, and so then another thing that we did that we started that was, that was brand new, and I'll say a little bit more, a little bit more about in a second, is we um, started a postdoc program. So we, we hired up, we're hiring up to eight postdocs, and these are not kind of postdocs in the traditional academic sense of postdocs. These are people who, um, in general, as, as is true for most of our staff, were um, domain scientists in some, in some ways. So they're physicists, uh, chemists, um, uh, meteorologists, uh, whatever, who fell in love with computing. So these are people that have started in the science, they've decided computing is what they want to do, and that's where they want to build their career. So this is a great place for them to, to continue that transition and also help us um, with, the, with, the, with the project of getting the codes ready. And then another thing is we've taken a lot of advantage of, of what I call community connections. So again, we don't have this huge amount of in-house in expertise, but we've worked with other HP centers, and I will mention this acronym an almost un unpronounceable acronym, IXPUG, which stands for the Intel Xeon Phi User Group. So this is a group that is independent from Intel, but Intel does actually give a lot of resources to in terms of expertise. And this, we started this user group, we expanded it, started at TAC when they had their, their KNC, their, their previous generation of, of Xeon Phi system. And it's now expanded um, worldwide. So we have, um, we have lots of people coming to us, lots of institutions wanting to ha have these user group meetings because the workshops we put on have been really valuable. It brings together a lot of expertise. NERSC has been a big player in these. And it's given a forum for us to work with other people working on the same problem as well as the Intel experts in, in trying to help these codes get ready for, for the Xeon Phi. So as I said, we started from scratch. And one thing we did is we had a, a reorg in the center about um, a year and a half ago to try to support some of this work. So we, we reorged into, into, we created two new departments. One was the HPC department that, that I'm head of, and we created a new data department to try to address issues in data. So within the HPC department, we started a, a brand new group called the Nurse Application Performance Group. And we, it's led by Jack DeSlip, who some of you may know. And Jack has really, um, kind of emerged as, as one of, I think, the, the world leaders in, in this kind of optimization um, work. And at the same time we did that, we went out and we hired some excellent, excellent people. So this was another key, is we hired um, people that were really good. And for the most part, all of, in fact, all of, these all of these hires that you see in green, Brandon, Thorsten, um, and Brian, um, had, were, had um, a science career before they decided to transition into computing like most of us. So um, these guys have been really successful working with the science teams and NESAP teams, and it, it really helps that they can go into to this work and speak the language of science. So they, they know how, how the scientists think, they know what their objectives are, they know in many cases what the codes are, and, and these guys have just done a fantastic job. And so some of the re results going forward. I mean, an interesting thing is that even though you know, Brandon was a material science and Thorsten was a, 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 a a QCD person, and Brian was an astrophysicist. Um, these people um, really fell in love with computing, and they, they wanted to step away from their previous science and, and get exposure to many different other areas of science. And so this is, this is kind of like the perfect job for them, and, and, and maybe the perfect job for you if you're interested in something like that. We have one new staff hire that um, has accepted, but I guess she hasn't told her, her previous um, place of employment, so I can't say who that is. But, um, these people are in green are devoted to, to working on this. And then the, we have, of course, the postdocs, who I said a little bit about before. And with the postdocs, we did not hire postdocs for specific projects. So we didn't say, here's a NESAP project, we want to go find a postdoc to work on this one. What we did was we put out a call for postdocs, and we tried to hire the best people. 
So we had people come in and interviewed. We hired the best postdocs and then tried to match them up with one of the ex existing um, NESAP teams. And so that's been really successful too. And um, what it's also done is it's given the postdocs the ability to, some of them have, have wanted to switch projects. And since they're not tied to a certain project, you know, if it's not working with that project, but there's another one they want to work with, then they've been able to go over there. So we have eight, um, so not every NESAP, not every NESAP uh, project has gotten a postdoc, so, but we found the best matches um, for these guys. And these guys are really good too. You can see we have, we have, um, we have, uh, we've budgeted for eight. We have seven right now, because three of them have graduated. One of them is Brian, we hired. Um, actually, and, and the other two, have one went back to, uh, to France, to a supercomputing center to be on staff, much like, much like NERSC. And then another one has gone to Intel. And one of, the, one of these, who um, it's not official yet, but has also gotten a, a, a position with Intel. So, so this has been a very successful program. Um, but then also within NESAP, uh, the people that are not in green, we also have other people in other groups at NERSC who are working uh, maybe part-time. So they're not devoted to this, but they're working uh, maybe 10% to 50% to of their time with a NESAP, with a NESAP code. So it's really been kind of an, an, an we say an, an all hands on deck project at NERSC to get these codes ready for the, for the Xeon Phi. So what I want to do next is, is say a little bit about what we actually, without going into too much detail, how we approach the problem. Um, and so to do that, I'll, I'll just give you a quick reminder of what, what Cori looks like. So it's an XC40 system. We has around 9,600 Intel Xeon Phi nodes. Um, each of the, each of the um, nodes has one, has one chip of 68 cores. So 68 hardware, there's 68 um, hardware cores, but they're, um, up to 200, supports up to 272 hardware threads running on these. So the, the, the on-node parallelism is somewhere, you know, up between 68, often between 68 and 272. We have the, the MCD RAM, the high, the high bandwidth memory, uh, 16 gigabytes of it um, on the node. But then we also have 96 gigabytes of, of what we now call slow memory, which is the, the DDR memory. And we're supporting all of the science community and this is really our system to transition to the next, uh, to, to energy efficient architectures. Another thing that's, that's, that's rather unique about this system is on the same network, so it's a, it's a Cray Aries network. On the same network, we have about 2,000 um, Haswell nodes. So Haswell nodes are, the, are Intel's x86 uh, processor that was one above Ivy Bridge, which was on Edison. Um, and so we have 2,000 of those, and we, we are calling that our data partition. So we're really trying to make this system, in addition to a very high performance uh, compute system, one that supports um, data intensive computing and experimental data science. And so to that, um, to that uh, in support of that, we, we also have a, an NVRAM um, burst buffer, so a very high performance. So we think at the time this was the highest um, bandwidth file system uh, in the world which was, it actually we exceeded the one and a half terabytes per second right into this file system. So we have a half, one and a half petabytes, uh, and, and really this is, is, is great for, th for things that are really I.O. intensive. We have a big fi scratch file system, and um, one thing we've done also is, is what we call software-defined networking. So though any of you who have, have worked on these systems know it's very difficult to get data from the outside world, on not only onto the systems, but, but onto the actual compute nodes. So with software-defined networking, we're, we're making it so that an experimental facility somewhere can take data and stream it essentially onto the compute nodes in, in, in real time. And part of that is also the, our, our job scheduling that we're setting up so that we have these on-demand queues so that we can support this kind of science. So uh, real quickly again, what is, what's different? Uh, I've said this before, I think, but we're going from 12 cores per CPU to, to 68, from going from Edison to, uh, which is our biggest system, what's our biggest system to Cori. Um, there's a lot, you can get a lot more um, operations on even on a single core, uh, but the question is how, how easy is this to get? So uh, we have wider vector units and it has, each core now has two floating point units on it, which um, Edison didn't. And then we have the high bandwidth memory. So one thing I do want to also point out is that we are working in NESAP with 
ex basically existing codes. We're not, in general, with a few exceptions, doing, we're not refactoring codes for algorithms um, and for methods and things like this, so, which is something that these codes will certainly want to do going into the future, but this is not the target of, of what we're working on right now. So given that said, some of our goals were we wanted to use standard constructs. So what I mean by that is we wanted, uh, our, our main way we're attacking it is, uh, is a hybrid MPI plus OpenMP um, coding paradigm. So what we didn't want to do is do something that wasn't going to be portable or carry on to some other system. So that eliminated things like we didn't want to use, say, vector intrinsics. So that's one way to get, to, to get good use of the vector units is to use vector intrinsics provided by Intel to, 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 to um, optimize that. We didn't want to use something like um, Intel thread building blocks. I know that some is very popular among some people, but again, it, it's um, kind of a, uh, not something that is, is out there in the general community. So that was one thing we wanted to do. We also, one thing we, we thought was very important was to take this work, whatever it was, this optimization, and make sure that it got into the code base for, for whatever code um, we were working on. So I talked to some people at TAC who had had um, some kind of a similar program when they got their, their, their Knight's Landings, their, their Knight's Corner system, which was previous, and they said one of their bigger, biggest frustrations was they were having a really hard time getting the work they'd done put back into the ongoing code base for whatever code it was they were working. So by demanding that we had a developer of the code in, invested in the uh, NESAP program, we were hoping that then that code would go back and it would, it would go on and, and, and other people could take advantage of the optimization work that, that was going on here. And then we needed really to collaborate with the community and, and leverage their expertise because even with the great hires we had in, into DAX groups and the postdocs, we're, we're just a few people and there's, there's 7,000 users out there and we can't possibly work with every one of them. So the, the actual optimization strategy was we kind of had a three-pronged approach is we needed to enable fine-grained parallelism in codes that they didn't typically have to take advantage of all those, those um, cores on the system. We need to exploit the, these vector units and the, and the dual FMAs that were on each chip. And so um, this was something that people had, had, even though there were SIMD units on the previous processors, for a large part, people had kind of ignored them because they didn't, there wasn't a huge payoff to using them. Now there's a huge, um, there is a huge payoff and, and it's a huge penalty if you can't take advantage on this processor of the, of the SIMD units. And then we really wanted to take advantage of this uh, high bandwidth memory, but it's only 16 gigabytes. So this means that a lot of codes had data structures that didn't really fit into 16 gigabytes easily or they accessed it in some, some manner that really was, was not optimal uh, in general. So before I go on and, and give some of the results, I just wanted to mention some of the things that really have gone well. And, and as I mentioned, requiring this FTE commitment, this buy-in from the, the code teams has really been important. The postdoc program's been huge uh, for this. The dungeon sessions, um, the pipelining the work, like sending the work to Cray and Intel and having, getting them to look at it before we, we have these dungeon sessions. We have lots of training events. Um, and then another thing that we, we've really forced the NESAP team to do is to document the work they've done on the web. So if you go on our website, you will find all these case studies about that describe what people did, what the process was, what they went through, and what the final results were. So this is how we transfer this knowledge back to our larger community um, of NERSC users and users in general. And then the other thing that has really been um, amazing in retrospect, is given where we started, is that through this whole process, we have developed, uh oh we have developed in-house this huge amount of expertise. And, and, and I think that we actually are now one of, the, one of the best in the world at doing this kind of optimization. Um, and we've learned about tools, we've learned about architecture, we've learned a huge amount about architectures that we, we just didn't know, and optimization techniques. Now people come to us to try to figure out how to optimize their code. So it's been hugely successful um, in that sense. And uh, just give one little example of the kind of thing I'm talking about is that we have developed this, this methodology to attacking the optimization of these problems. So Jack and his team um, are doing lots of things in a process that can be repeated from, from, from code to code. And one big part of this is they're using this roofline model. So I don't know, are people familiar with the roofline model? Anybody 
Right? So the roof line model is a, is a way to think about um, optimizing your code. And it was introduced in a paper by Sam Williams and others uh, in Berkeley not too long ago. Um, and if you look, uh, without going again into huge detail, if you look along the, the x-axis of this uh, plot, you see it's arithmetic um, intensity. So what this is, is the ratio of, of floating point operations in your code to the amount of data had to, you had to move in and out of memory. Um, and, and so along this axis, if, you're down, if your code is, is down over here, it means that you're, you're memory bound, so that your, your memory, your, your compute is waiting on your memory accesses. And if you're way over here, it means that, you, that you're not, that you're, 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 you're CPU bound, or you, you're bound by the, 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 the speed of the, the floating point ca um, capabilities of the CPU. And this blue line is a, is a characteristic of the hardware that you're on, right? So figuring out where this blue line is exactly is gives you the limit it, depending on where you are here, this is the fastest you could ever go. So that's why it's called the roof line. You can't exceed that. That's the theoretical maximum. So the, the, the idea is that you take the original code, so I'm not sure which code this is for sure. I think um, it's one of the electronic structure codes. I'm not sure. If you take your um, original code and measure it and plot it on here, you see this red bar. So you see that you're at uh, your very memory bandwidth bound here. Um, you but you are not anywhere near the performance maximum you could be getting. And so going through this, um, this process that Jack has, which uh, I'm not gonna really explain, but one thing they do is, is tiling. So this is, is breaking your code ups to make better reads of cache and of memory. And so they implemented tiling and that moved them up in this plot so that they, they were getting more, um, more flops per, per memory access they had to do. And it moved you up over here and then they implemented um, the vectorization in a better way, and it moved them up even closer. So from starting here, they're now up here, and you see it's a log scale. So the performance is about 10 times what it was, but it really gives you um, a visual way to see that you're getting closer and closer to the maximum performance you could get on that processor. And, and it could well, it probably is that this algorithm just doesn't allow you to move any farther over to, uh, one way or the other. So this is um, something that is, is, has been d developed. We didn't, we didn't invent the roofline model, but we, things we have done is we've used it extensively. And another thing that we, we did was we worked really hard with Intel to get their tool, to build a tool that lets you um, figure out the roofline model. So now in this Intel Advisor performance tool that Intel has, you can run it and it'll give you, it'll figure out this blue line for you and it, you can also measure where you are on this, and it'll give you a visual representation of this. So this is something that I think is hugely important because one of the, the big things that you always asked yourself when you're trying to optimize code was, yes, I know it's running so fast, but how well am I taking advantage of the actual hardware? How close am I to, being able to, to using the hardware? And, and usually what that meant was you'd run something and you'd look at an output that gave you some hardware counters and it gave you a big number of this and cache misses and blah, 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 but you really didn't know how to interpret that. Right? So this gives you a model that, that lets you do that. And so they published a paper um, in collaboration with the XPUG and, and a workshop at, I think this was at ISC, um, and if you notice on the paper, uh, one thing I'll point out is it's, it's Jack and some of his staff, it's the postdocs, it's some of the people from um, computer science uh, and what's called computational research division at Berkeley Lab. And prior to this work, there really was not uh, a, a real synergy that, that we would have liked to have between the facility, which is NERSC, and the computational researchers. And they're kind of off in their own, their own different spaces. And this has given us an opportunity to work more closely with them. And I think it's really benefited, benefited everybody. Okay, so what's the payoff? What, and so this is a, a cartoon. I'm gonna show you some actual results in a second, but this is kind of typical of what we see and, and what we wanna see. So um, to measure performance, we will take our original code and we'll run it on, on Haswell. So that's now become our kind of baseline. We have that on the Cori system. Um, and this is the thing that was kind of the option for uh, one thing we could have done instead of buying the Intel Xeon 5 processors, we could have just bought a system that had 10,000 Haswell cores, right? It's approximately the same price, approximately the same power, approximately the same footprint, same number of nodes. So that was an option. So that's one thing we want to look at. 
And then we look at, in the end, and I'll show you some results later, is something that's really great. So this is, this is, this is our success. This is our optimized code running on the Xeon Phi. And, um, and I'll just say that every comparison I'm making is on a node-to-node -node basis. So it's two Haswells versus one Intel Xeon Phi. So another thing we will then go and look at, and this is something we see through this work, is if we take this optimized code that we've been targeting to the Xeon Phi and take it and run it back on the Haswell, it is almost universally two to three times faster on the Haswell than it was in the original code. So what this is saying is the optimizations that we targeted towards um, KNL, towards the, the Xeon Phi, are optimizations that would have, that had a big payoff on the original processor too. And I think this somewhat reflects the fact that people didn't really have to do anything to get a faster code as the processors got faster with every generation of systems. So there was, no real, there was no real incentive to do anything when you were getting faster anyway. But it does show that if you had gone back and optimized code um, for that processor, you could have gotten two to three times the performance um, that you were getting anyway. And then we also want to look at the original code on the Intel Xeon Phi. So this is another thing that is almost universal, is if you took your original code and just recompiled it on the, the Knight's Land and Xeon Phi processors, it would run slower. And, and then I don't think we have any exceptions. So if we did nothing and just bought a Xeon Phi machine and people just took it, their code and recompiled and ran it, it runs slower. And I, I think that I have some numbers later that it's about 30% um, slower on the Xeon Phi, the original code, um, without any work. And then finally here in green is, this is the, the challenge I gave to Jack and his team. I said, get these NESAP codes and first, and then the, the nurse community in general, so that their codes are running. And the number, actual number I gave them was 20% faster on uh, Intel Xeon Phi node compared to a dual core Haswell node. So this is, this is what he's shooting for. And he was, pre, he, was pretty, um, he was pretty dubious he could do it in the beginning. But um, as we'll see, he, they actually um, surprised everybody. So here are some actual results. So this is a very busy plot. And I'll show something a little bit um, simpler. Um, what it is is they took all the, the codes and ran them on Edison, and that is a, a baseline. So all the all the blue bars are the Edison co uh, the Edison code, um, but they're all scaled to one. So we're doing everything relative. So the performance on Edison is the blue bar. That's the Ivy Bridge system, dual core Ivy Bridge system, and then there's all these different things like um, the optimized code running back on Edison, which is faster again. The, the, the code running on Haswell, which is, would have been faster. So I have some numbers that show this. So you could have taken, and if you do take your Edison code, recompile it and run it on Haswell, it is faster, it's significantly faster. And so that was kind of what I call business as usual if we hadn't gone to the many core system. Then there's the Haswell optimized code in red, um, and then the KNL baseline and the KNL optimized. So what you might really want to look at is the, is the, the, the brown ones, which is the, the, the KNL optimized, and, and they're, all, they're all bigger than the, um, we were when we started. Um, but you might also notice that some of the Haswell optimized are, are perform better than the, the KNL optimized. And so that's, that's just true. There's, there's, there's going to be some codes that run better on a, on a, on a chip like a Haswell or like a, a Broadwell um, than they are going to be on, on the Xeon Phi. But, what is, I think, also significant is that the Xeon Phi is still an, a, a significant improvement over what we did have. So some other ways, some other things to look at that I'd like to look at, um, taking out some of the things, if we just look at the Edison baseline, which again is one, and the Haswell baseline, so that shows how much better it would have run if you just recompiled and run it on Haswell, and then the KNL optimized. So what this really shows is the effect of um, getting a KNL system and the NESAP program combined is really a win in, I think, all cases but, but one, this one molecular dynamics code. And then another thing I like to look at is to take the, the KNL baseline code, which is, means just recompiling um, the, ba the, the original code on KNL and then compare that to, the, to the, the, the optimized code. And this really just shows the effect that NESAP, just the NESAP program has had. And so, I mean, it's just kind of um, astounding to me that we're able to do this given two years ago we started with, with almost no expertise and almost no ability to, do, to work with the community. And then here are some of the actual numbers um, that I'd like to look at. 
And so there's a little bit of code here, but the first one is, is what I call business as usual. So if we'd just bought a completely uh, a Haswell system and taken the codes, recompiled and run them on it, um, it would have gotten a, you know, a decent performance. Everybody would have been happy they're running 60% faster on that system. Um, but it's very critically, it's, it's not on the path to exascale. So it's not, it, eventually we're gonna reach a dead end in, doing, in, in that kind of, a, a kind of a strategy. Another thing I like to look at, like to look at is, is the, the KNL, the K is for the, the Intel Xeon Phi optimized over the Haswell baseline. And so this is a really important number to me because this says what improvement have we gotten on these codes or on the workload, and we hope this extends the workload in general, over kind of what I call business as usual. So this two and a half times performance increase is really shows the effect of not only getting a KNL system, but then get also using uh, the NESAP program. So NESAP plus KNL has gotten an improvement of, of, of 250% over what we, we would have had otherwise. And then there's some other things you can look at. You can say, um, if you just look at the, the optimized on Broadwell and just NESAP, you know, a lot of this 2.5 is just from NESAP. Um, and the 4.0 is, is, is what people are gonna see if they have optimized code moving from our Edison system to the um, KNL system. And then again, if we had no NESAP, but we'd gone to the many core system, uh, which we would have had to do at some point anyway, we, uh, we, things would be running 30% slower. So just 70% just of peak. So that's our success. Another part of our success is this plot. So anytime you get a new system, and Bill can tell you, um, but especially if it's a new architecture that you always worried that the community's not gonna be able to use it for some reason or another. They're not, the, codes, the codes aren't gonna run well, they don't want to use it. Um, and I guess that's, the, the, that's kind of the nightmare of people that buy a new system is it sits there idle because it's unusable. Um, so this, this is very reassuring. So right now, um, Corey, the, the, the Knight's Landing codes are running in uh, free time. And so all our users have free access to it. And what's really good to see is that the, the system is almost completely busy all the time. And so there, there's white spaces here that we've had outages and upgrades, this sort of thing. Um, but we let, started, we let all users on um, starting in, at the end of January. And this is a backlog. So right now, uh, last time I looked at this, in the queues we have 10 full days worth of work. So if we turned off the queues and just let the system drain, drain, there's enough demand in the system right now to run the system completely full out for 10 days. So people are using it. And then I'll just flash this up here quickly. It's just a list of the top projects that, are, that have been running. And so you might uh, recognize some of these uh, in common with, with, with your codes. You know, there's a lot, there is a lot of QCD. Uh, that's kind of um, people always ask uh, if the system's uh, heavily used. The, the, the first thing they ask is, well, is it used by anybody other than the QCD people? And, and so we can, say, we can say yes. So the QCD people are using it, but there's also um, you know, some electronic structure and, and some quantum codes and, and, car, and the, the climate uh, materials, and there's fusion code, and, then, and there's some other chemistry codes. And uh, there's just the breakdown. So we can see that the community at large is um, using the system. So a lot of material science and chemistry, and these are actually the people that I think that we were the most worried about. These are our biggest communities, but they're also the ones that have the codes that we thought would have the most trouble using Knight's Landing, and so it's really, it's really satisfying to see that, that they're able to take advantage of the system. And uh, I wanted to put this up too. So again, we, we have just the NESAP teams, but we have, uh, we have all of our, our codes. And one thing that, that uh, Jack and his team have done is they've taken this process that they used to first characterize codes and then figure out where they want to attack them. And they've made a web, they've essentially made a web form that we ask our users to go to. And we, we have some experiments that we ask them to, to, to do with various tools and then put in numbers you know, here's what my me measured memory bandwidth was, here's what my measured what, whatever it is. And, and then this form produces um, a roofline plot and it produces some other things. And if people go to that, this is so far voluntary, but if people go through that process and report what their code is doing and characterize it, then we let them have access to the full system. So until you do that right now, you can't get access to, to the full system, just a, a subset of nodes. And um, these are all the codes that have gone through and done this process. So we think these codes have looked at the, these, these teams have looked at their codes enough and understand them well enough that they're able to run on um, 
on the Knight's Landing, on the Intel Xeon Phi nodes right now. So it's really a pretty impressive list of codes, and um, these are the ones that, that are ready. So I think, um, you know, we had, the, we had the thing yesterday, and so as, as in, my, in my senior science advisor role, I, one thing I, I get to do, and I, and I have no shame of doing, is talking about other people's science and trying to explain it. So I've thrown some things in here to talk about the early science on, um, on the Xeon Phi, but I think that I will skip over that, um, even though I would like to do it, and there's some cool stuff. But what I will, uh, I'll mention two more things before I close, it's about time, is that we are, now going, we are now starting a NESAP for data. So we're going to have a few post, four postdocs assigned with that and use some of the, the same techniques with the goal of getting data-intensive science onto Cori and onto the, these many-core processors and these many-core architectures. So here's, here's just one example that Prabhat at NERSC is working with, and I think we heard a little bit about this um, earlier in the week in, in terms of the, the LHC, uh, the Atlas data, um, but it's also do, doing things like taking um, climate simulations and automatically identifying extreme events in these, in these climate simulations um, to build up the statistics. So looking forward, we know more change is coming. Um, so we're starting, uh, we're getting ready with, for NESAP2 or NESAP++ as we're calling it. We have the NESAP for data. Um, Whenever we announce our next system, which will arrive in about 2020, which we call NURSE 9, we'll, we'll start a, 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 a similar NESAP program targeted at that particular architecture. And in the meantime, we're working on things like application portability. So DOE has a, an application portability uh, initiative that we're working with, with Argonne and Oak Ridge that will make recommendations for, for how to code in a way that will be portable among different architectures and also sustainable. Um, we're looking into exascale programming models and languages like UPC++, SPX, um, Cocos, and some other things. Um, another thing we want to do and that we're, we're, we're aggressively trying to work on is getting seats on the standards committee boards, like for OpenMP and MPI, to incorporate things that are important to our user community into the standards themselves. And then we're trying to do a lot more with collaborating with... Um, with applied mathematics uh, people and, and computer scientists, which was something we really haven't done too much of in the past. So in summary, um, you know, this, this, this many core architecture really provides unprecedented capability for our researchers, which is something they really need. Um, and we've enabled a large percentage of the workload, workload to run efficiently, but not all of it yet. We, we're taking these lessons learned and we're trying to really communicate them to the community, um, NERSC and outside, the postdoc program has really been something that has been, uh, it was new for us, we didn't know how it was gonna go, it's really been extremely valuable. And, and the collaboration, collaboration with the application teams, the vendors, and the community, um, you, really, you really cannot do something like this without engaging the larger community of people that are trying to do the same. Okay, so I thought I was going to, I thought I could close, I started with a, with a Greek philosopher quote that said something about happiness or success or, 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 or optimism moving to the future, um, but the best I could do was this. So I kind of gave up after way too, mu after way too much time um, searching on Google to try to find one and decided that I would just leave you with a picture of a cute animal. <laughs> okay, thank you. So thank you, Richard. Uh, the thing, uh, all speakers from Berkeley, they always have wonderful pictures of sunsets from where their office windows. Um, but uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions, if anybody has one. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the KNL architecture, but I think that the high bandwidth memory that they provide can be configured in a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. And what I was wondering was, uh, with the application codes that you're running at NERSC, has one particular configuration for that high ban bandwidth memory emerged as maybe a preferred mode of operation, or is it just kind of all over the place? Maybe some codes benefit from one mode and some from another. Right, so uh, <clears throat> the, the high bandwidth memory can be configured in, in two basic ways. One is it, it can be um, used as the primary source uh, of memory, but it's 16, 16 gigabytes, and so you, you can use that as your primary store. You can also configure it to, um, in a cache mode. So if you, um, if you have a code that uses more memory than the 16 gigabytes, um, you can use it as a cache, and so that would give you better performance because it would, it would, be, it would, it would serve as a cache. So we thought going in that um, 
the, the direct uh, method would, would have a, a huge performance advantage uh, over the cache mode. Um, but it turns out that it does have, but it's smaller than we thought. So co most codes see maybe a, up to 10% performance um, improvement from using just the, the high bandwidth memory in, in not cache mode. Um, but it's more difficult to do that. So you have to do a little bit of coding um, as opposed to the cache mode. So we, we right now have, uh, switching between modes takes a reboot, which, is, which is, uh, takes a long time. So right now we have part of the system in cache mode that all the time, and we have part of it that, peop that people can reboot from one to the other. Um, so there is a slight performance um, advantage to using it out of cache mode, but cache mode has been surprisingly useful. It, it might be a good default for most people, which will make it, make it easier to use. So when I think about uh, data intensive computing, naively I think the float to I.O. ratio is gonna be small, right? But, you know, so I was wondering what the roof line looks like uh, you know, going forward with data intensive computing. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. Well, so, I mean, you were talking about, you know, getting the floats per memory. Per memory access. Access, yeah. getting that up. <clears throat> right. Naively, I think that sort of goes against what data intensive computing is yeah, about. Yeah, oh, so yes. So I was just wondering how you address that. <clears throat> so, um, we don't know. So we're trying, we're trying to figure this out, um, to tell you the truth. So this is what we're starting with this um, data intensive uh, NESAT program and, and, and this reorg that we did to, to try to put an emphasis on data. So I think that's a, a question I don't have a good answer to because we don't know what's, what, what's really gonna happen, but you're right. So data, in, a lot of a data intensive computing is uh, like genomics, is a lot of random access um, computing and it's not, not these adjacent, adjacent bits of memory that you can fit into HBM and this kind of thing. And so it's, it's something that, that we're really exploring. I don't, I don't know. Um, what a good answer to, for, for you is, but I do know that we don't have um, 9,600 one terabyte nodes that we can give to this community, right? So um, yeah, so it's, it's a great question and it's, it's something people are trying to figure out. Yeah. Okay, so I, I understand that you know, you've been working on optimizing for single node performance for a couple of years because of course yeah. you only had a couple of nodes available. Right. Um, KNL has you know a, a lower single core frequency, which means if you have any serial bottlenecks in your code, those serial bottlenecks will be worse on this common platform. Now that you've had the the full machine in operation for I think five or six months now, um, do you have any scaling studies showing how um, codes are operating at scale on the machine uh, versus more traditional processor architectures? Sure. So you're right. So we concentrated on single node performance, and then. Um, we want to look at scale, at performance at scale. So what I can say about that is that um, we do have some codes that are running really well at scale, um, but our studies have been, I guess I give our dirty laundry here. Our, scales, our, our studies have been um, kind of thwarted right now is because we are seeing a very high variability um, from run to run in a lot of codes. And I, th I, think, it's, I think there's something in the network that isn't working right. Um, whether it's a hardware configuration or whether it's um, a, some kind of software thing. Um, I can't really answer that question on this system because our, systematics, our systematic studies have not been successful um, because there's something going on we don't understand. So there, there's, so there are codes that are doing really well at scale, um, but there's a, it's something we have to figure out. And I think we will figure out by the time we go in, into production, but it makes it hard to answer that question yet. Um, which, which I really, which I think is, is a really important question because we have 9,000 nodes. Argon's next system will have tens of thousands of nodes. And so this is, this is something that the community needs to figure out. And of course, uh, Blue Waters has a, a lot of nodes as well. So sorry, I don't have a good answer for you yet. Um, very impressive uh, talk. I, I would like to ask about the costs of um, optimization. So the, the benefits you showed, but like what percentage of the code had to be rewritten, how much work it took, and, and so do you have any kind of statistics? Mm. So, so to see what people look into when they want to fork the code. So what I can say is we've been do we started this two years ago, so we've essentially been working for two years. Um, 
some codes take a, took a lot more work than other codes. Um, one of the biggest things, one of the, one of the, one of the major things that the codes that have to be kind of rewritten the most are ones that had very um, poor data layouts to begin with, right? And so, um, you know, if you, if, you lay out, if you lay out your data in a very kind of non-friendly way at a very high level, then it's, it pervades through the whole code. And then, so those are the ones that took the, took the most work. And in that case, a lot of the code needs to be um, reworked. In some, cases, in some cases, it might just be that the main loop um, is, you know, it's, an, it's a structure of arrays and, you can, or, and it should be an array of structures or, you know, or vice versa, or there's um, some way you can take out dependencies that break vectorization, and, and those are relatively simple. So I think it, it, it varies a lot from code to code, so I don't really have a good rule of thumb, but um, I guess the best way to, to characterize it is that it's, it's taken, you know, there's been two years of work of steady progress um, with these, and, that, and um, based on the experiences that, that um, Oak Ridge had when they got their GPU system for the first time, um, I remember them saying that it was about two um, FTE years of work on their codes to get them ready to. So I think what we're seeing is, 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 rel is, is relatively consistent with that um, to get the kind of performance that, we're, that we've been showing here. Okay. I think we have two more questions, if they can be fast. Oh, thanks for your talk. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, you, you guys kind of saw KNL as a nice transition for your users from CPU machines before you went to a heterogeneous machine. Right. Um, but some of the software, like, like Gromax, is already heavily optimized for GPUs. Right. Um, so based on you know, some of the applications that saw performance decreases on after optimization, um, do you, do, was there something common between those where the optimizations you made for KNL weren't the same as the GPU or also were not as good as on a traditional chip? Mm. That's, uh, so I, I, I don't know the answer for the molecular dynamics because, as you said, the molecular dynamics codes didn't do very well in GPUs. Um, the, the other one that didn't do very well and the ones that, that have trouble are some of the AMR codes. So those, they're, you know, non, a non-structured mesh, and so there's all kinds of um, various d data dependencies and, and, and this sort of thing. So the, so the, the AMR codes have, have not done that well. I don't really have a good answer for you for the, for the MD codes. I could, I could try to find out more, but yeah. Uh, so I have a question. So uh, do you see any benefit to hybrid the CPU uh, node with the KL node? Like say, uh, use a CPU node uh, for the uh, control flows and uh, use, still use a KL node as an accelerator to offload the uh, numerical intensity part. Right. So having the, so, so our nodes are, are homogeneous and we, and we have the Haswell nodes and we have the KNL nodes, but they are all on the same network. So we don't have any heterogeneous nodes themselves, but I think it will be interesting and, and people are starting to play around with this now that we've got the whole system integrated, is running, running jobs that ran across the two different node types. So exactly, you could do, you could do some kind of control or uh, visualization or something that, that um, doesn't work well on KNL on the um, Haswell nodes and then offload the work that, that does work very well on the, on the Knight's Landing nodes onto those within the same program. So it's, so it's not really a heterogeneous um, node, but you could think of it as a, heterog as a heterogeneous model. So I'm, I'm hoping people will explore that um, uh, method. And one, another, another thing that has been brought up is, is perhaps going the opposite way is running the, the main simulation on the KNL nodes, but then doing some kind of in-situ or real-time visualization or data reduction on the Haswell nodes at, at, within the same job. And so I think that's another um, interesting use case that, that we'll be looking for, but it's still really kind of too early. People haven't, people have been concentrating on doing other things and really haven't started exploring that space yet. So I'd like to thank Richard for his time he spent with us and uh, all his insights. Um, I also appreciate him sharing a little bit dirty laundry so that we actually get a little insight into the real stories going on, so thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, so we like to transition 